the Dentalpreneur Podcast. Okay, doctor, it's time to put down that handpiece. You're listening to the show dedicated to helping dentists get their lives back. It's time to decrease your stress, increase your profitability, and regain your passion. Now introducing your host, Dr. Mark Costas. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Dentalpreneur Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Costas. What's up, guys? I hope you're doing awesome out there in podcast land. I'm super excited because I have a repeat guest and a friend on with me today. Today, we're going to welcome Brandon Moncrief to the podcast. Brandon is the CEO of dentaltransitions.com. I guess you would call him McLaren and Associates CEO, and he has over 20 years of dental industry experience as a banker and sell side advisor and has been involved with over a thousand successful practice transitions. Brandon's firm, McLaren and Associates, is a full service dental practice brokerage firm and sell side advisory for DSO transactions. Uh, their service includes dental practice appraisals, practice sales brokerage, sell side advisory for DSO transactions, transition consulting, and partnership consulting. Brandon's unique combination of analytical and sales skills, in addition to his extensive experience in practice transitions, allows him to serve as a valuable advisor and resource to his clients. What's up, dude? How are you doing today? Hey, what's up, Mark? Doing good. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I'm glad we got to catch up just really, really briefly in the pre-chat. Um, tell me about what's new with your company. It sounds like things are starting off very, very hot in 2023 for you guys. Yeah, 2023 has been busier than than we anticipated. And I think that's a, a product of, of several things. Um, we've obviously expanded nationwide and put a lot of energy into building the brand. But I think dentists are starting to realize, large practice owners are starting to realize that they need representation if they're going to go the DSO route and, and take their practice to market rather than responding to an unsolicited offer or some mailer or just calling a DSO that their buddy sold to. I think they're starting to realize that they need somebody like us at the table to provide objective guidance and optionality. And then we've also got, I think, a lot of people that are worried about what the economy is going to do in the back half of the year. We've got rising interest rates, a potential recession on the horizon. And uh, there's a little bit of a rush to market in that regard to sell while valuations are high and, and why demand from private equity and DSOs is uh, is really at a peak. So Brandon, are you doing a lot of doctor to doctor sales or is this mostly uh, doctor to DSOs or doctor to PE? What, what are you seeing in, in the marketplace right now, partic particularly this Q1 of 23? We've got a healthy balance uh, of both doctor to doctor transactions as well as DSO transactions. So our doctor to doctor business has been pretty steady, you know, year over year for decades. Uh, where we're really seeing the the boom in activity is on the DSO private equity side of the business. Mm. Uh, the the consolid consolidation of the dental industry has really, really caught fire, you know, over the past couple of years coming out of COVID after dentistry survived the, the pandemic and rebounded very, very quickly. Yeah. The private equity players, the DSOs that were already in the marketplace doubled down and, and started to acquire practices at an even faster rate. And then we had a lot of new DSOs, a lot of new private equity firms enter the dental industry. And uh, that's caused, you know, just widespread consolidation, a lot of activity, but also, you know, a lot of noise, right? There's a lot of uh, interesting players in the market now. There's a lot of fake hustle. We're seeing some DSOs struggle operationally, financially, seeing banks starting to constrict the availability of capital to some degree. So there's a lot of movement across the marketplace. And there's a lot of DSOs that are doing it right, that are really healthy and in a position to continue growing. And, and then there's some that, you know, are struggling. Oh, dude, I'm so glad you opened up this, uh, this door in Pandora's box. I want to, I want to kind of go down this road with you a little bit. So if we're talking about the good ones versus the not so good ones, and we're talking about DSOs here. So if you are a person that is looking, uh, from the outside, looking in as you are every single day, you're seeing these transactions, you're seeing like the A players and maybe the C minus players. What are the DSOs that are struggling why do you think they are struggling? Is it is it an operational issue? Is it that they are targeting and purchasing bad practices? Like from your perspective, 
why do DSOs struggle? It's, it's not one particular thing across the board. Now, I will say that a lot of DSOs struggle to operate effectively at scale. You know, maybe they did it well when they were at 10 or 20 locations, but it's a completely different ballgame to operate effectively with 100, 150 locations. Mm -hmm. So scaling a, a business in a sustainable way and building infrastructure in a way that you can truly support those businesses long term, especially when the founders eventually exit the business and retire, that takes a lot of talent and fantastic systems. So I will say one of the reasons DSOs are struggling is, you know, operationally. And some of them have proven the ability to aggregate, to buy practices and integrate practices at a very, very fast clip. Mm -hmm. But now they're being tested from an operational standpoint long term, especially as plans to, whether it's IPO or, or recap, maybe get put on pause as we enter this different economic climate with highest higher interest rates. Um, some of the DSOs are, are over levered. They've been very, very aggressive in acquiring practices at, at peak multiples over the past few years. Sure, yeah. And as they, they struggle a little bit operationally, their banks are going to constrict the availability of capital. So where banks may have been willing to give them capital at seven times EBITDA, and they can pretty much count on leverage to fund all of their acquisitions. Those same banks today may only be offering four and a half to five times EBITDA in leverage. So if they continue to buy practices at seven times EBITDA, now they have to bridge that gap between what their bank will give them and what the purchase price of that practice is. And if they're not well capitalized, if they are not sitting on dry powder, whether that be through the EBITDA that they're generating within their organization or the equity that they can leverage through their private equity sponsor, they're not going to be able to grow. They're not going to be able to continue to pay those multiples and continue to uh, to buy practices in this environment. Awesome. Great answer. So um, you're probably so sick of answering this question, but what is the, what is your table of EBITDA to, to uh, multiple? So, I ask you this every time I talk to you and it, it changes slightly um, from time to time based on the marketplace. Right. So it, let's just say, you know, you're a, you're a $2 million practice. You're a very effective practice. You have 20% EBITDA. So you're 400,000. Uh, what is that? Uh, 2 million times 20%. What is that? $400,000 in EBITDA. What is that practice going to fetch on the open market right now? As far as a multiple. I mean, the good news is if you're checking all the boxes that, mm -hmm. that DSOs are looking for, right? If your EBIT is over, let's say 300,000, you've got hopefully a couple of providers, a couple of docs or more. Mm -hmm. You've got a decent sized facility and you're within, say, 60 miles of a major metro area. Practice values are still at an all time high. We have not seen an adjustment in values at all. So, a practice that checks all those boxes that's around the size that you said. 400,000 in EBITDA on top line revenue of 2 million, it's going to trade for anywhere likely six to seven times EBITDA. So somewhere in the ballpark of 2.4 million uh, all the way up to let's, let's call it 3 million. Okay. And then um, as you go up this table, so say 400,000 is six, then... Six hundred thousand. What's the what's the next step up that we're that we're looking for? Yeah, so we kind of bifurcate the market into three hundred thousand in EBITDA to like let's say seven hundred and fifty thousand in EBITDA. Okay. Those practices, if they check all the boxes, are going to trade for somewhere between five and a half times EBITDA to, to seven times EBITDA. Okay. And then once you get over seven hundred and fifty thousand, especially over you know, nine hundred thousand to a million, is kind of that magic mark where the EBITDA is going to go up about a turn. So those practices are going to trade for anywhere from six and a half to, to seven and a half times EBITDA. And then when your EBITDA ticks up above 1.5 million, particularly around 2 million, is when you're going to see multiples go up from somewhere in the range of seven to, to nine times EBITDA. Uh, at 2 million plus, you could be a platform investment for a private equity firm that's looking to establish a new DSO. 
And those multiples could be as high as 10 to, to 12 times EBITDA. And you're saying um, north of 2 million? North of 2 million. Most PE firms that are looking for platform investments, that are looking to start a new DSO, are looking for a multi-site practice with EBITDA of 2 million plus, and they're willing to pay a little bit higher premium on that platform investment than they would for you know what they call a bolt-on in addition to a platform. Gotcha. Okay. So um, I want to go back. I, I love your boxes that you check. So um, these are questions that we hear often from people that I talk to. Should I buy this for operatory practice as a satellite practice? You know, it's 10 miles from my current practice. Um, there's one doctor that, that works in there. Uh, he's a workhorse. He wants to stay for 10 years. Um, it happens to be 120 miles from the closest major airport. Do you buy that practice? I know your answer, but uh, this is, I, I'm I'm working the back door of of your checklist here. So as far as just the things that you mentioned offhand, it doesn't check several of the boxes, even if it's even if it's a high producing practice. So so tell me about this particular practice. Do you pull the trigger on this as an advisor? Um, and if not, what are we looking for? Yeah, and I want to make the point that rural practices can be sold, practices in tertiary markets, but the buyer pool is much smaller mm -hmm. and you might take a little bit of a hit on, on the EBITDA multiple. Just from a risk perspective, doctor and staff recruiting is tougher in those markets. I think to answer your question, it depends. If at some point you're going to look to monetize your business in the DSO private equity world, you need to think real hard about how you grow. In an ideal world, mm. it's not about storefronts, right? It's not about locations. It's about EBITDA. It's about profitability. It's about efficiency. I would much rather have a practice that's doing $5 million in top line revenue with one location that's really, really optimized and has a high EBITDA margin mm -hmm. than a practice that has $5 million in top line revenue with three locations that has a lot of fixed overhead because of the occupancy costs and the staffing involved, the practice with one location is going to trade for a much higher valuation because valuations are predicated upon EBITDA. So if you're looking to, whether it's start a satellite office, purchase a satellite office, you need to be thinking about if and when you're going to exit. Mm -hmm. And if that's going to be in the DSO private equity marketplace, it's all about EBITDA. So if you're going to do a startup, it's probably going to take three years for you to ramp it to generate any type of meaningful EBITDA. So you might be pausing your, your go-to-market strategy for three years to give that practice the opportunity to reach maturity before you look to sell. If you're gonna buy a satellite office or a third or fourth office, you need to make sure that you've got enough runway to ramp up the EBITDA before you go to market and look to affiliate with a DSO. Um, otherwise you need to buy a practice this, that's got strong EBITDA from the onset. Uh, and that's really where the arbitrage occurs. If you've got a strong business, core business, and that's marketable in the DSO world, and you want to scale that business before you go to market, look to buy practices that already have strong EBITDA, two, $300,000 in EBITDA, mm -hmm. that are doing somewhere between a million and 1.5 million in revenue, where you're not competing head to head with the larger DSOs to buy those offices, you can buy that practice for maybe four or five times EBITDA. But because your core business is already operating at a threshold where you're going to trade for seven times EBITDA, eight times EBITDA, by buying practices at four to five times EBITDA, you're creating immediate arbitrage. Overnight, by that practice becoming part of your organization, you've doubled your money. And it's the same concept as when you own a practice that's worth seven times EBITDA and you affiliate with a DSO that's going to trade in a recap for 14 to 15 times EBITDA, you're recognizing that arbitrage. It's just done at a, at a smaller level. So you need to be consciously thinking about what is your exit plan? What's your runway? Should I buy this practice? Should I start this practice? Because I cannot tell you how many times we interact with clients that have a badass core business. They've got one or two offices that are each doing three, four million, really, really efficient. And then they do a startup 
and then they look to go to market. And now we've got to deal with this startup. Mm-hmm. You know, we're going to get real creative on deal structure. We've got to do some types of earnouts to give our client the opportunity to see that business reach maturity before the purchase price for that practice is determined. Or they buy a practice and the transition doesn't go well or didn't have an impetus to begin with. And now they've kind of got this, you know, this mediocre business that they're they're dragging along with their core business. And we've got to figure out how to solve for that. That That's a really, really great point. Um, and I see this a lot. A lot of people like trying to put lip, lipstick on a pig. It's like, but it's such a good deal. It's like, well, you have three solid practices already. Why are you taking this on and focusing 100% or 80% of your now attention to this tiny little thing that has potential because you got a good deal on it and you're taking your eye off the moneymaker or the, the the three practices that got you there in the first place. Um, so I want to circle back again. So I have written down multiple providers within, with ideally multiple providers. So what's the capacity of that particular location? At least six or seven ops? Yeah, I, I would say six plus ops. Six plus, right? okay. Multiple and- providers. It doesn't have to be multiple providers, but a lot of the DSOs are moving towards wanting to mitigate key man risk. So they sure. love practices that have two, three doctors, you know, PPO, fee for service, patient base, uh, top line revenue of 1.5 million plus EBITDA of 300,000 plus ideally located within 60 miles, you know, of a major metro area and all specialties. So there, there was a day where certain specialties there, there really weren't private equity buyers. There really weren't, you know, DSOs interested. Now we're seeing Perio, you know, start to to consolidate quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, OMS and Ortho are, are are super hot, you know, at the moment. We've done quite a few pedo transactions. So this is happening across the full spectrum uh, of the dental industry at the moment. How about super GPs with like super exotic skill set within that particular um, practice? For instance. There's a ton of my friends that are very, very surgically based. Um, and because of that, they do a lot of exotic surgery, all on X, a lot of, lot of full mouth restorations, IV sedation, um, super, super high top line, very profitable, but potentially difficult to find somebody that they could replicate to put in that model. Um, are they getting downgraded as far as uh, multiples uh, in that type of situation? We've seen multiples still remain high for super GP practices, especially implant, you know, focus practices. Okay. There are a handful of DSOs that have uh, really focused on partnering, acquiring those type of practices. Mm-hmm. But I will say the buyer pool for those types of practices is much, much smaller than it is for kind of bread and butter, you know, restorative practice. If they have a strong hygiene and restorative component, you know, multiple providers where the owner's the super GP doing all the all on four, you know, complex, you know, implant placement cases, but they have a couple of general providers that are doing the the crown and bridge and they have a strong hygiene program, you're not going to see those practices are ideal, right? They're going to be probably high top line, uh, very efficient high EBITDA practices, Mm -hmm. but the production is bifurcated between multiple providers and there's not near as much concentration in that one provider. Sure, Those practices you see sky high demand. It's the ones that have really no hygiene program with a single super GP provider that we have definitely less demand for among DSO buyers outside of those, you know, two or three buyers that Really, that's their lane they want to be in is partnering with those GP, those super GP practices. The larger, middle to large size DSOs that have primarily a, a general practice portfolio, they're starting to pull back from those super GP practices because there's more key man risk and in an economic environment where everybody's a little bit more risk averse you're going to see DSOs not be as aggressive in pursuing those type of opportunities. Got it. Got it. Okay. Uh, Back in the day, I want to say probably in the early-ish 2000s, there was this hot money that came into dentistry, and then we we saw a a lot of consolidation 
uh, with dental practices. Uh, the pioneers of private equity and and these these larger DSOs were gobbling up uh, smaller practices and regional groups. Um, and then we came up with this, um, I guess, uh, term called duct tape DSOs, where doctors like that were friends from dental school and ended up practicing in a relatively close area would put their arms around each other and duct tape themselves together in an effort to get to, 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 um, combine their EBITDA so that now instead of five, you know, $200,000 EBITDA practices, they, they had, uh, you know, one, one group loosely affiliated group that now was a million dollars when you added it all together. Um, does that still work is my first question. And is there a way to make that work where you get people together and you, you add that, that, uh, the total value together and create a small group? I am so happy you asked this question. Yay. So this, this concept really caught fire. Like you said, when the hot money was in the market, mm -hmm. when, there were multiple DSOs talking about a potential IPO. And a lot of doctors thought that the premise you just laid out could work. And I will say in very limited situations, it has worked. But the hot money, the dumb money has left the marketplace, right? The IPOs are on hold indefinitely. Mm -hmm. Like we've been talking about through this conversation, banks DSOs, private equity, are getting a little bit more conservative than they've been over the past few years. So that concept that was extremely, extremely difficult to pull off, even when the hot money was in the market, is incredibly difficult to pull off today. Now, is it possible to take a few practices in the same geography where the doctors have the same why as to why they're pursuing a DSO affiliation. They've all kind of agreed on what they're looking for and the practices are all similar in nature. So they're all general, all kind of have the same type of procedural mix, patient mix. They look somewhat homogenous from office to office. Is it possible to take those three offices to market in combination and get a slightly higher multiple? Yes, it is possible. I will argue though that that limits optionality and we ultimately find out oftentimes that the doctor's whys are different and they all gravitate towards a different buyer. And then everybody's, you know, kind of at, at disjointed in regards to uh, how they want to proceed. There are a bunch of people right now in the marketplace that are pitching this concept on a massive scale. And they're saying, we're going to sign up 150 doctors. You're going to pay... $25,000 to join our group, and then you're going to pay monthly fees for administrative services. Mm -hmm. And Doc, on your own, you're worth, your practice is worth six times EBITDA, but as part of our collective, we're going to sell as a whole for 10 or 12 times EBITDA, all to the same group at the same time. For lack of a better word, that is complete bullshit. It's complete snake oil. Do not allow yourself to play into the hands of one of those groups because that concept is designed so that the people that set that group up, that set up that co-op, they win no matter what. Mm -hmm. They bleed you fee, they, they bleed you dry with fees all along the way in the promise that they're going to hit a grand slam in the bottom of the ninth with two outs. And the reality is that's not the environment that we're in. And the people that have been pitching that concept have been unable to pull it off over the past two years, yet they continue to sign up doctors at an alarming rate. Um, so I'm glad you brought it up. I'm pretty passionate about that topic. Uh, I don't believe that, that that scheme is currently palatable to the marketplace. Got it. Okay. So how about a group of friends then that has very similar why, okay, regionally close by, how can they make themselves bulletproof and attractive? Like what centralized systems or software, or is it a call center or is it, you know, a CPA? What is it that, what thread can hold them all together that makes them a legitimate group? Former company, former real DSO. 
Okay. So form they form, a, they, form they form a DSO. They all kind of equilibrate the cap table. So now right. like, you know, they, 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 they all came in with different EBITDA like um, totals. They put their arms around each other. They formed a DSO. They threw all their equity into a pot. Some people had to buy up. Some people got paid out. They're right. all, they're all 10 to 20% uh, owner of the DSO. Now yes. what happens now that now they're legitimate and they would be looked at with, with serious eyes. The fact that they actually came together as partners in the business and developed a brand, if you will, mm -hmm. even if their practices keep their individual brand, okay. they developed an actual company, right? Where they're all partners in that business mm -hmm. and they need to basically merge their financials, mm -hmm. right? Use, use the same uh, accounting firm, same bookkeeper, uh, all get on the same practice management software and essentially become one business. Now mm -hmm. there's a lot of risk in that, yeah, right? Of course. And becoming partners with people who are friends, but who you've never actually been in a partnership with. Um, and if it doesn't work out in the sense that your goal is to take that business to market in a year or two, mm -hmm. and if you're not all swimming the same direction at that point or a transaction doesn't occur, are you all prepared to continue in that partnership long-term? So if the answer to that is yes, then like you said, form a legitimate business, combine the cap table, build infrastructure, integrate, have commonality throughout the business in regards to financials, operations, PMS, and then after you've been one company for a year, maybe two years, now you look to potentially go to market and sell to one buyer. Right. Uh, that is palatable to the marketplace. That will command a higher multiple. But the duct tape DSO concept where you're just going to be loosely affiliated and call yourself a group, that does not work. Yeah. And I guess, I guess further... Um addition to that legitimacy would be as a group now a DSO, you continue to seek practices to purchase and tack on to this group. Correct. Yes. You want to have a fully integrated scalable platform. That's the key. That's where the higher multiples come into play. It's very, very difficult for a DSO or private equity firm to acquire multiple practices simultaneously and then integrate them all and build infrastructure around them. Mm -hmm. That's expensive and it takes a lot of time. Therefore, they're not going to pay a premium multiple. But when all that work has already been done, mm -hmm. and that is a developed platform that is immediately scalable post-acquisition, that's when you see the increase in multiples. Got it. This is such good stuff. All right. So maybe you could walk us through this whole bite of the apple scenario that everybody talks about, right? And some people throw it around not really knowing what they're talking about. Some people use this analogy incorrectly, but what does it mean when your second bite of the apple is going to be, you know, equal to your first payout? Like for instance, um, say you have a million dollar EBITDA practice, right? Um, somebody says your first bite of the apple, you're, we're going to pay you 60% cash, and then you're going to have some earnouts. And then the second bite of the apple is going to be even bigger than the first bite of the apple. What does all that mean? Like dumb it down for us as if I'm a kindergartner. What it essentially means is you're going to sell, you're going to liquidate a portion of your business at the initial transaction. Taking some chips so, off the table, as they say. Taking some chips off the table at a favorable valuation. So when we talk about EBITDA multiples, when we talk about a 6X or 7X, let's use the example that you said. You've got a million dollars in EBITDA and you're gonna sell for an initial valuation of seven and a half X, and you're gonna liquidate 80% of your business. Okay. So that's a seven and a half million dollar valuation, and you're gonna take 80% of that seven and a half million in cash at close. The other 20% of that seven and a half million, you're gonna invest in, let's say, holding company equity. You're gonna buy stock in the DSO's parent company. Okay. And you're going to have the opportunity to liquidate that equity in part or in full when the DSO reaches a recapitalization event. So this is on now, their terms. You don't you don't have any say as far as when you take the next chips off the table or when you fully 
um, exercise your ability to, to get that equity? Most DSOs are on a, a five-year recap cycle. That's that's their goal, okay. is to recap within you know a four to five-year window. So you don't get to control when you liquidate that equity. You don't get to control how much equity you liquidate, and you don't get to control the multiple at the exit. So that's how most uh, private equity investments work, though, right? It's not just in the dental world. If you're involved in any type of what they call alternative investments that yeah. are private equity backed, you basically invest and you, you really have no control as to when these events occur and what the return is. Mm -hmm. I think you need to judge the history of that PE firm, both in the dental world and other medical verticals. You need to judge the uh, uh, how strong the pedigree of the management team is. And you need to ask questions, right? When was your last recap? When's your next recap expected to occur? Uh, what is the current stock value? And what is the projected stock value at recap? Um, you need to have them quantify your potential return. But just understand, it's all assumption-based. Mm -hmm. Nothing is etched in stone. So if and when you reach a recap, assuming you generate a handsome return on that holding company stock, and it could be anywhere from just getting your money back. There was a recent recap from a huge DSO where investors that were holding uh, holding company stock for three years did not generate a return. They just got their money back. For some people, hey, that's good enough. At least I didn't lose the money. But for a lot of people, they're betting on this arbitrage that, that they have the opportunity to experience through investing alongside private equity. Ideally, your, your money would return a three to four times return, you know, post-investment. But you've got to evaluate at what point are you stepping into the recap cycle? If they just hit a recap and you're stepping in mm -hmm. where you're going to have to hold that stock for four to five years, you would expect a more significant return than if you're buying the stock four years into a five-year recap cycle and you're going to hit a recap after just one year of holding that stock. Your return is going to be muted the later you enter the recap cycle. So you have to evaluate, especially from offer to offer, where is each DSO at in a recap cycle? When am I going to have a liquidation event? And what is the return going to be? And that could vary widely depending on who the DSO is. Yeah. So, I mean, that that varies depending on what your um, desire is as well, right? If you want to get, if, if, you know, it's seven and a half times and you want to capture that full value sooner than later, uh, maybe the ideal DSO that you're looking for is a little bit later in the cycle, right? So maybe they're four years into a recap cycle. So you can count on hopefully in a year, I'll get my money, the rest of my, you know, my initial uh, valuation back. Or if you're a little bit younger and you're willing to kind of hang in there for a, a higher potential return in the second bite, maybe you're looking for a DSO that's a little bit younger in the in the recap cycle and they are one and a half or two years into a five-year recap cycle. And maybe that would be better for you in, in that case, if you're willing to take a little bit of risk and wait that's, a little bit longer. That's very well said. And I'll also make the point that smaller DSOs can generate more arbitrage than larger DSOs. So if you bet on a DSO very early in its inception, it's a riskier investment on your part to partner with the DSO that's maybe got 10 or 20 locations as opposed to 120 locations. Therefore, you would expect your return to be higher. So smaller to medium-sized DSOs will typically generate larger returns on the equity than larger DSOs will generate. The larger the DSO, typically the more muted the return. So you have to evaluate where you're in the recap cycle and then the size of the DSO. And that should translate, assuming all the assumptions come true that they've outlined, into a higher return if you enter the recap cycle earlier and or partner with a smaller DSO. Yeah, good stuff. So are you seeing these uh, the building of these DSOs prior to, to private equity um, coming and snatching them? Are you seeing? Is it possible to to use bank uh, bank lending and and not private equity? Um, at, at what at what point do you see these? Um, so, I guess small to mid sized DSOs hit that ceiling of 
you know, you, you've maxed out on your credit through a traditional institution. Yeah. So normally when you hit around 3 million in loan exposure it is where, you know, banks start to tighten up, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of the traditional dental lenders uh, get nervous when they've got too much money out to one borrower, mm-hmm. right? Because if for some reason something goes wrong with that investment and that borrower can't repay their loan, it impacts their loss ratio across their whole portfolio. Mm-hmm. So we have not seen, there are a number of lenders working on bridging the gap between conventional financing and private equity, mm-hmm. but nobody's really, really figured it out yet. Not not where it would be appealing to a, a wide group of emerging DSOs. So that's the reason that a lot of emerging DSOs will partner with private equity maybe sooner than, than they atten- intended because they run out of runway with the, the conventional lender that's backing them. Uh, I also want to make this point because I, I think this kind of goes into what we're talking about. It's not just about the availability of capital. A lot of emerging DSOs get to an inflection point where they're at, let's say, five locations, and now it's time to determine, let's say I have all the capital I need, right? That that problem is solved. But now it's time to determine what is my end goal? Is it time for me to build a legitimate DSO and build infrastructure, right? Have an HQ and start to centralize a, a lot of services, make that investment both in time and people, and then continue to scale the business from there? Or does it make sense for me to go ahead and go to market and leverage the infrastructure of an existing DSO that's already built the wheel, right? Where we can partner and overnight, I've got access to that centralized infrastructure. I don't have to be the one to build it and pay for it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a natural inflection point that a lot of practice, uh, successful multi-site practice owners reach. And many of them will decide to build the infrastructure, make that investment, but then go to market too early in the sense that they haven't scaled the business enough to offset that investment in infrastructure with growth in top line revenue and EBITDA. So by building the infrastructure, you actually take a step back from an EBITDA perspective, and then you've got to scale and grow to get your EBITDA back to where you were before you made that that significant investment in the business. And you've got to accomplish the growth in order for the organization to become more valuable. So in other words, if you were worth seven times EBITDA, when your EBITDA was, you know, a million dollars, but then you make a massive investment in infrastructure and don't grow your top line to the point where you get that EBITDA up back to a million, but hopefully a million five, two million to where the multiple increases substantially, Mm -hmm. your business may have been worth more prior to building the infrastructure than after two years of a hell of a lot of work and a massive investment. So the difference between being a private equity platform, trading for 10 to 12 X versus a DSO affiliation trading at seven X, the valuations might be congruent. So it's not all about EBITDA multiples, it's a multiple of what? You've got to gauge where your EBITDA is at and what your multiple is at that point in time versus where you want to get to and what your EBITDA is going to be then. It could be a higher multiple on a lower EBITDA number, and you could have been better off going to market two years ago at a higher EBITDA number at a lower EBITDA multiple. Does that make sense? It does. I, I, I think what I'm I'm hearing you say is that sometimes creating the infrastructure that could potentially take you to the next level could take enough of a slice out of the EBITDA that you've actually lowered the valuation of the entire organization. And if you sell before you increase the value to hit that break even point again, and then get beyond it, then you've sold too early for the investment in the infrastructure. That's exactly right. Yes, sir. Gotcha. 
All right. So what, and, and I hate to beat a dead horse, but what exactly is that infrastructure again? Are we, are we talking about a C-suite? Are we talking about a call center? Like what specifically is so expensive that could potentially be worth investing in to get you to that next level and to make you even more attractive to private equity buyers, you know, in the long run? You're talking. You're talking about centralizing accounting and bookkeeping. So likely having a controller, a CFO, uh, a highly compensated employee. You're talking about uh, middle management. So you're talking about having, you know, potentially regional office managers, right? Somebody to manage, you have six offices, maybe you need two of them, each to manage three offices. Okay. You're talking about likely a call center, centralized insurance verification, okay. centralized billing and collections. So all, all of these services cost money, take, cost money <laughs> yeah. and, and are a big investment in systems and, and, and time. Mm -hmm. uh, time's extremely valuable and you need very, very talented people at the HQ to manage these functions or they're actually going to be managed more efficiently at the practice level. So you have to acquire talent that understands how to scale these centralized services across all your practices and actually provide efficiency. You don't want to do it in a way that it was actually more efficient to do it at the localized level because yeah. it's going to come at an increased cost. So it, it's amazing how difficult it is to find high quality operational talent. And if you are going to find it, it's going to be very expensive. Okay. So what about renting or outsourcing this um, the, these services. For instance, is it is it still as valuable if you are all using the same verification company, but you don't own it and it's not in house, or you're all using the same CPA, but you don't own him. He's not he's not um, you know he's a 1099er, but he still services all of you guys the same way, or you know insurance verification. What what else? Uh, billing uh, a billing service that you all use so it's all consistent but you don't you don't actually uh, employ those people is that as good or is it the next best thing or are you not going to get the value um, uh, if you do it that way it's a it's a double edged sword so as a as a platform as a private equity platform investment that type of infrastructure is not scalable long term okay. so you you have it you need to build it internally in order for private equity to truly value it, right? If you're outsourcing it, the positive thing about doing that is it could come at a little bit of a lower cost mm -hmm. uh, and you don't have to build it yourself. There's already experts uh, in that field. Mm -hmm. uh, but the problem is those experts don't have a vested interest in your business long-term. So are they going to be as effective if they don't truly have skin in the game? Sure. Uh, the good news is if you pivot away from a private equity, being a private equity platform investment target, and you move to being a DSO affiliation target, it's very easy for the DSO to come in and eliminate those costs from your EBITDA mm -hmm. because they already have infrastructure right. to replace what you're outsourcing. So from that perspective, it's great. But from the perspective that it doesn't really allow you to serve as a private equity platform, they're not going to view you as a platform, if you're outsourcing that infrastructure and those third party companies don't have skin in the game, you know, from the, the perspective of being truly employed by your business and maybe even having some equity upside, you know, how effective are they going to be? How efficient are they going to be across the platform? Really, really great answer. I appreciate that. All right, dude. So we are uh, towards the end of our time together. I would love it if you could share your contact information. You're one of our awesome sponsors. So we talk about you all the time on the podcast, but maybe you could take a, a second to let people know how they could reach out to you um, if they have a larger practice and they want to uh, uh, get into a transition kind of uh, conversation with you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Everything we do starts with a discovery call. Let's get to know each other. Let's talk about your why. Let's talk about your goals. Let's talk about your practice and, and see if this you know makes sense. They can reach by my cell phone, 512-660-8505. Email is Brannon, B-R-A-N-N-O-N, -N -N, at dentaltransitions.com. 
And I encourage people to go to our website, dentaltransitions.com. It's got a lot of podcasts just like this, a lot of great articles uh, regarding DSO transactions. But I'm here to be a resource for for you and your audience and uh, appreciate you having me on. All right, man. Well, thank you so much for your continued support. Every time I have you on, you talk about something different and nuanced and you're educating our audience to a large degree. So I really, really appreciate you. And uh, best of luck for 2023. Sounds like it's um, starting off really well for you guys. Thanks, Mark. Take care. Ladies and gentlemen, Brandon Moncrief.